Well, tonight uh, uh, or today, wherever you are, I guess, uh, uh, or uh, whenever you're watching this recording, we're going to talk about building huge sites in Webflow. Um, and so to just kind of lead into uh, a little bit about my background here and, and why I'm talking about this. Uh, one, I've been building in Webflow for a really long time, but two, my current position now at Webflow is I get to work with customers uh, in enterprise uh, who, are, who are using Webflow Enterprise. So essentially customers come to Webflow, they end up buying Webflow Enterprise. Once they become enterprise customers, they end up with an account team. We get to work with wonderful uh, customer success managers and um, we have our, our awesome, if you've dealt with Webflow support, you know how amazing those folks are. So they get, uh, there's an enterprise support team, but they also get technical architects, which is what I do. And so it is my job once a customer has signed up for Webflow Enterprise to make sure that they launch their site successfully um, and that they're able to achieve their business goals with Webflow. So I get to work with a lot of larger logos and I get to work on them, work with them on a lot of sites that are pretty sizable and uh, and uh, very complex. And so uh, tonight, what I want to do is, again, I don't want to dominate this conversation. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to take you through some, some points here um, and talk about some of the key pillars that I think uh, I, I think are most important when you're talking about how to build huge websites with Webflow. Um, I'll also point to another expert in the room who could give this talk with their eyes closed, and that's Corey. So uh, if you ever want to have that conversation with someone else, uh, one of your own, Corey, uh, uh, incredible uh, Webflow developer, and does this uh, 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 as well on a daily basis. So let me share my screen, uh, and let's take off. So... All right, so instead of slides, I just built a Webflow site because, you know, when in Rome. Um, and so let's talk about uh, building uh, building uh, huge websites in Webflow. So there are a few key pillars, I think, that we have to talk about. And the first is anytime you're building a site that's going to be sizable um, in Webflow, uh, the first thing you need to do is start with your content. So a lot of people talk about content first design. Um, and I think it's super important. So one of the things that happens in the community all the time, right, that I see people are like, yeah, I just start in Webflow. I just jump in Webflow and I start designing. And I think uh, for smaller sites or certain sized sites, that's okay. But whenever you're building a site that has to scale and that's going to hold a lot of content and that needs to run for a long period of time and that uh, you'll, you'll uh, be working in for a while, you have to make sure that you have your content nailed down and that you have a plan before you jump into the designer, right? So really, uh, you can see here, this is a Fig Jam, uh, one of my favorite tools, Figma, I love. Uh, so we're talking about favorite no-code tools. Uh, this is one of my practices. I like to get into that tool and I like to put my scheme, like lay out my schema um, and make sure that I understand what are my collections, how are they tied to each other, what needs to be displayed on the page when I'm when I'm using those collections. And then, um, and then once I kind of have that map, understanding how everything is going to tie together before I ever step into the designer. It's the same thing with uh, my designs. I don't want to uh, start jumping in and trying to build things and experiment in uh, my main project. If I want to do that, I'll have something separate. But it all it all starts with your content. And the reason I say that is because one, content first design is really smart. Edgar Allen, props to them, uh, Mason and that crew. Kendra, they do a great job talking about that. So if you ever visit the Edgar Allen site, they've got a lot of great resources around this. But two, there is nothing more painful. <laughs> you can't like there's nothing more painful than creating a Webflow site, creating a collection, uh, and then starting to to put in content and starting to connect everything together and realize that you need to display certain content or you need things to lay out in a little bit different way and having to go back through. And, and edit all of that content, it is the most painful thing in the world. Now think you don't have, I think the average Webflow site has less than 500 items in the CMS, right? Like it, it's not a lot of content, right? And most of us, we build sites. It's like, yeah, we've got content, but it's not. Now imagine you have 50,000 items in your CMS and you missed a field. Um, the, the, the cost, the expense of that is huge. And so, you know, typically when we're working with enterprise customers, they have traditional development resources on their end. And so, uh, you know, that means they're writing API calls to try to upload or try to update 
all of this, you know, 50,000 rows of data to try to account for, for these changes, it just becomes very expensive uh, from a time standpoint and an effort standpoint. So first things first, like you have to really understand your content. You have to understand your, your schema when it comes to your data, your, your CMS collections, and how that's all going to tie together. So whiteboards, murals, Miros, fig jams, what it, whatever you love, uh, no hate on any tool, uh, chalkboard and, a, and, and, and some chalk, whatever it takes to sort of get this down and understand where you're starting. So I think that's the first key pillar. So the second piece is we're going to talk about design, but really talking about design systems. Now, there are a lot of frameworks and style guides that exist out in, uh, out in the wild in the Webflow community. Uh, in fact, we had a couple of them mentioned here tonight. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of enterprise partners who have theirs available. Um, the number one thing that you have to have, so first of all, you need a design system that's dry. And when we say dry, we mean don't repeat yourself. You need classes that you can, re you don't want two classes doing the same thing. Uh, so a lot of times when I run into larger sites that have problems, they will have a really good naming convention, but they, a lot of the classes that they're using are doing the exact same thing. So they have all of these classes, they end up with CSS class bloat. Um, and, uh, you know, with Webflow, uh, we have one CSS file, one JS file. So that ends up becoming a problem. You're, you know, uh, have this really large CSS uh, file. <laughs> that's a lot of it could be done with just fewer classes. So you wanna keep it dry. You wanna make sure your, your class system doesn't repeat itself. Your class system or your design system needs to have a layout with it, right? So if there's no column system, there's no grid system, um, it's probably gonna put you in a place where you're not as successful. So you need to find ways to quickly be able to lay out um, columns uh, and, and structure on your site with that design system. Uh, and then again, as we start thinking about designing that, designing, uh, there's a lot of times when you start thinking about you know, going back to content, content, bringing in a design, how you're going to display content that's referenced inside your CMS. So understanding the difference between multi-reference and single reference CMS and how that can display and how you can pull that through. So just really working through all of those pieces is super important. So having a design system, not just any design system. It has to be the slimmest, the meanest, the most, uh, the, the design system has the most utility you've ever seen. You want it to be light. And, and design systems, I want to just make this really clear, they're not meant to be restrictive. Like the, the point is not to like have to play this game where you're like, how can I do this with the fewest classes possible? But when you have a base, you can get 80, 90% of the way there before you start adding any custom classes in, which again, keeps your CSS uh, bloat down and really makes your site more performant. So design systems, second pillar. Third pillar, uh, accessibility. If you don't think about accessibility first, you are, uh, you're you really missing out. And, and I think, um, first of all, accessible sites show empathy to folks, right? It's the right thing to do. I think there's this, uh, if you, I don't know if you've ever heard of Wave or WebAIM, they have a great tool that will audit sites. But every year they do a, a they do research on on sites globally, and they talk about all of the like how many how many folks are browsing the web who who have some sort of disability. And um, you know it's funny when they talk about like the top one million websites. I think it's like under ten percent are actually optimized to be accessible. And you have a billion people in the globe who are disabled who are trying to navigate those websites. Now put that math together. It's, it's really painful for a lot of folks when they browse the web. Um, so you want, you want to do the right thing and you wanna make sure the site's accessible to everybody, right? I think that's super important. Um, but on top of making your site accessible, it also means your content's available. That's a billion people that weren't in, in your funnel before as, as a customer or they weren't in your audience before, right? You're, you're, you're uh, uh, making yourself available to a wider audience, but there's also a lot of crossover with accessibility and SEO, right? So alt text on images and having the right hierarchy when it comes to headings and the using semantic lists and all of these things that become really important when you're building a site. So if you want to build a site that scales, you need to make sure that you're hitting the mark from an accessibility standpoint. Um, you know, it's it's really important to be inclusive. It's really important to care about every person that comes across your site. And it's super important 
for your own uh, success as a business uh, as well, just from how, again, things cross over from an SEO standpoint uh, to make sure that you are, are, are handling that right. Okay. So the next piece is the Webflow platform. Uh, a lot of people ask me all the time, like, what are the new features that you love most about Web? Like, what is, and, and what is the new feature that I, you don't know, like nobody knows about? Can you tell me a secret of like, what? No, I can't tell you anything. I, most of the time I don't know myself, right? So like, uh, but I will tell you my favorite thing about Webflow and it's the designer. We can add on logic and memberships and all sorts of pieces. But I think um, the first time I got to experience Webflow and I realized it was a true abstraction from HTML and CSS. Like my mind was just blown. The magic that exists in that designer is really powerful. But when you're building web, large websites, and uh, you know, some of you here may be building a large websites, you may have, um, you know, you you may have an enterprise client yourself, right? Enterprise customer, and and, and that is anyone here can do that, right? You can go land an enterprise customer a really big website, something you should know when you're building is you do have this magic of the designer, but you also have this power that comes with being an enterprise customer. There are things like CMS scalability where CMS customers get up and above 10,000 items inside the CMS, you know, up to 100,000 plus items in, in, in the CMS, right? So now really quick and you have page branching, which allows you to um, basically make copies of pages, uh, branch them. Like if you're, uh, we have some traditional developers here in in the uh, in, in the audience, so you know if you've worked with Git, creating those branches and and uh, and altering your pages, it also allows for more people to work in the designer. So instead of having one one person working in the Webflow designer at a time, you have multiple people working in there. Um, uh, but at its core, that that designer makes it makes Webflow magical. So content design, accessibility, understanding the perks of what it is to like be building like an enterprise web flow site, right? Like all these pieces that come along with it. Uh, the one thing I will say, regardless of all those features, um, and one thing that I'll put right here in this web flow platform piece that Corey could probably speak to uh, better than anybody is your communication game better be on point. Um, no matter how many people you have working on branches or, or whatever uh, your approach is, um, communicate, communicate, communicate. Who's in the designer? What are they doing? What are they tackling? Um, it is important. Most of the teams, the successful teams that I've seen building inside of Webflow, they have processes. The, it is um, an air an air table, uh, which a lot of people have mentioned here. And you can go in and they list all the projects in there. And you can like put your name in a cell and change the status to like, I'm checked in. And it, boom, it pings a Slack channel. You know, Ben has checked into the designer on this project and is working on whatever. You can put notes in, send it through Slack. We want to know where are you working? What are you working on? And also you want to have good governance around who's publishing, what are they publishing? Um, and, and also you want to be thinking about staging, uh, production, um, you know, how are you running that and, and, and what does that look like? And in fact, some customers with their staging domain, they'll use DNS to hide it and find, you know, you have to be a part of the company VPN in order to even see that domain, right? So uh, they kind of keep things locked down and protected from the public. So just a lot of things to think about whenever you think about how all of this ties into the Webflow platform. Now, the next piece is around performance. Ooh, okay, so here's the problem with no code. Um, often folks say like, oh, it's no code, so it's really easy. Uh, and that is that is not true. Uh, uh, just because it's no code doesn't mean it's it's a walk in the park, right? It typically means uh, it typically is going to be challenging, and even more so when you're working on a large site. Uh, never rely on any tool or platform to size your images before you. Always size your images appropriately before they hit the the, the Webflow platform. Compress uh, size, compress upload. Um, follow best practices when you're loading images. Inside of Webflow, you can choose lazy loading or auto. You want to make sure anything above the fold is auto or eager. Anything below is lazy. Um, you want to lazy load everything you can. This includes most of the time having to use a little custom code. Lazy load your background videos. Lazy load your Lottie. Lazy load embedded videos. Use uh, what they call facades. And I have some 
uh, code I can share around some of these things that we've have in some repos if, if anybody wants it. But essentially, like, I'm not going to load that YouTube video. It's just going to be an image until somebody hovers over it. And then like, oh, we'll load that that YouTube video into place and, and only call it when we need it, right? So anything that we can do, even if you have chat bots, like a lot of people have those chat bots. And I know a lot of times you they want it to be active and it pings you like, oh, hello, you're here on my page. Talk to me. Uh, I personally loathe that pattern, but a lot of people do it. They get interaction, right? Uh, but it's even more helpful if that bot the intercom logo is just a picture. And when I go to click on it, now I actually load the bot in place and it pops up. And so instead of spending all of my, uh, I always uh, talk to customers about, um, think of it like you have a budget when it comes to, to, to when a page loads. You don't want to spend all your budget on this tool that's for chat that somebody might use, right? Um, you really want to make sure you're optimizing and, and doing everything you can to only load what you need for that first contentful paint uh, when people actually start uh, working with your page. And then a lot of people use custom code. Um, I use custom, I write lots of code. Uh, you want to avoid, whenever you can, using global code. If you can, if you have global code, code that's going to run on every page, great. If not, code split. Right, you don't want to load a bunch of JavaScript or load a bunch of CSS that you're not going to be using on every page. That again, that's costly. Um, you know, the browser spending time parsing JavaScript that never gets used to try to figure out what it's actually going to use. Um, so you just want to be very smart about what resources you're loading, which gets us to the next point, which is third-party tools. Oh my gosh, uh, this is the the vein of my existence. And uh, the worst part of my job, because I've got to tell you, uh, a lot of people will come to me and they'll say, Ben, my page is not performing well. And they'll be like, what's up with Webflow? And I go look at their page and I'll go to PageSpeed Insights. And if you've used that, that's like Lighthouse and the, the developer tools right in the browser. But it's live. It's actually a 28 day tell of actual user experiences like those page load speeds. And you go look and everything that's flagged is like they're loading Hotjar, they're loading Facebook, they're loading LinkedIn, they're loading Twitter, they're loading Google Analytics, they're loading Segment, they're loading Google Tag Manager. They're, if you go on a site and you just put Google Analytics on a page and then you test the speed, uh, I encourage you to do it. You'll see your page score, your page speed score or your Lighthouse Lab score uh, drop pretty quick just by adding Google Analytics, right? So you have to be very thoughtful about how you include these, these, these uh, third-party tools. If you're using a script, script defer, add defer to it. Like let's defer the cost until we need it, right? Um, which is uh, you can add it like after the opening script, you can just type in defer, little space. And it, basically it means we're not gonna load this until we need it. We're gonna wait till the page is finished loading then we're gonna load this in, right? Um, if you use like Google Tag Manager, Google Tag Manager actually has a mechanism to say, don't load this script until somebody actually scrolls the page or begins interacting. Like there are different triggers here. So instead of loading everything at once, uh, load, load it when you need it. Um, and I think more importantly, sometimes this is hard. So if you begin working with enterprise customers or really large customers who are building really large sites, or maybe it's even your own project and you have your own team, you own this company, uh, or you're a part of a team that's driving a project, the hardest thing to do is negotiate internally uh, or with customers about what they actually need. Because they're like, oh, we're going to add hot jar and we're going to do this. Like, are you actively running campaigns like paid spins? Like, let's, we don't need that. Let's, let's cut back everywhere we can and try to defer uh, or get rid of that cost. Because the easiest way to, to deal with that is just to not have it, right? And if you're not needing it, if you're not actually using the data, if you're not actually A-B testing, um, and then there's actually a whole argument about st statistical significance. Like, a lot of folks who get caught in this uh, conversation, they don't even have enough traffic for it to be statistically significant anyway. And so they're get, gathering all this data and it's not really enough data to, to help them. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, weigh the cost, pretend you have a budget, weigh the cost, weigh the benefits, um, you know, and, and really dial in, use uh, Lighthouse, use Screaming Frog, use Ahrefs, use uh, use these tools, use uh, WebAIM, um, use a screen reader on your own site and, and learn how to use a screen reader, navigate your site, learn uh, what your weak points are and continually improve. 
um, and keep measuring that progress as you dial in performance and keep those third party tools in check. Now, the last one is continued learning. Um, so I, I don't know uh, how many of you read regularly, uh, check out web.dev, um, but it's a, it's a site from the Google team. They talk about what, what's important from like SEO perspective, like what, like really neat uh, web browser APIs, like all of these different things. Earlier this month, they released an article. They said, these are the most important things for page performance, right? Like uh, your site performance. It was a great read. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, what's awesome is Google often changes what's important when it comes to ranking. Uh, but they have said that like passing core vitals is in your 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 site performance is does weigh into ranking right and then in this article they start telling you like here's what you have to do to keep your page ranking well and uh and so they they give you a lot of the answers it's just spending time reading some of those sites and, and a lot of them even if you aren't super technical um man it, they they're still navigable right like it's it's easy to kind of dig through those so we just encourage you to continue uh, to learn, continue to uh, invest time in learning. Uh, one thing that I try to try to the approach I try to take is even, oh my God, this is uh, 20 some years later of building sites, right? I still try to wake up every day and pretend I don't know. Um, and, and I want to be hungry to learn more. And I want to be hungry. Like, there are new technologies all the time. There are new ways of approaching it. And I want to be flexible. And I don't want to pretend I have all the answers because I don't. Uh, and there's a lot of people who are doing cool, innovative things. And I want to learn from them, right? So it's continuing to put yourself in a place or in a seat where it's like, hey, I, I can learn. I can actually learn here and get better here. And I can improve here and do better for uh, my, my business, uh, my customers, my friends, my community, whatever it is. And so just continuing to take that approach is, is super important. So those are the things I think that you really have to think about, right? It's, it's uh, just to sum up and then I'll, we'll open up to conversation, but we, we really want to make sure we have our content and a plan in place before we touch the, brow, the, the designer. Hands off keyboard until you really have a solid plan. Don't figure it out on the fly. Uh, have your design system in place. It's got to be dry. It's got to be lean. It's got to be mean. It's got to be solid. It needs a layout system. Uh, focus, please, on accessibility. Um, uh, you know, from uh, uh, from a Webflow platform standpoint, if you're working with bigger customers, reach out to that enterprise team because they've got cool, cool magic that's going to really empower that big customer or that big site that you're that you're working on. Um, performance. Super, just super important, right? And Webflow gives you a lot of levers to control how performant your site can be. Uh, and the one thing I will say is sometimes there are trade-offs. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give this, this disclaimer here too. This is a part of my rant. I, I'm not a huge fan of tons of interactions. Um, uh, and I, I, I think, when we, expect, we go back to accessibility again, simple user paths, right? We don't, some folks have cognitive disabilities and we want to make it easy for them to understand where they're supposed to go. So anytime you use interactions, what is the value? Is it helping me convert? Is it bringing value to the business, right? So really just building rock solid sites that convert, that are performant, that do my thing. I'm respecting a user's motion preference. Corey can tell you all about that. I love doing that too. It's one of my favorite things. Um, keep your third party tools in check and then keep learning. Um, you know, there's always something more to learn. There's always something new around the corner. And I think that's part of why I've been doing this for so long is because it you can keep learning. Everything feels fresh and new. All I mean, a lot of you maybe have dove into the Rive app and are building like you're just like, wow, like there's just so many cool things all the time that are happening. And and, uh, uh, and so it keeps things exciting and super fun. But uh, that's what it takes to build huge websites and Webflow. In, in my humble opinion. <laughs> that was great. Did you say Thank the you. Rive app? Yeah, Rive. Have you seen R it? R-I-V-E? Oh, uh, yeah, like uh, Rive. Oh. oh so if you, if, if you wanted like, to build, yeah. yeah, if you wanted to build Lottie animations, but you're like, After Effects is intimidating to me. Rive. Uh, Fable is another good one. Um, there's some fun stuff out there. I love it. 
Uh, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not an After Effects guy, but I have thought like, oh, maybe I should do that. And then I remember I'm not a good designer. And so I'd stop. Um, <laughs> I've got a to few questions. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and then now this is the time, if anyone else has questions, feel free to feel free to chime in. Um, but I'm curious. So we're, we're just so that we're all on the same page. When we say huge websites, what does that mean to you? What is a huge website? Yeah, huge websites are sites that have lots of CMS data, and they have lots of pages, lots of static pages, and they have to hold a large amount of content on that static page. So you have is, lo is lots of pages. Uh, is that are those static pages? Are those CMS pages? Both, and then and then what is lots? Is is that yeah, hundred a hundred pages is the limit with Webflow. So we're talking people are pushing the boundaries, and they're up to a hundred pages. In fact, I have a lot of customers who have multiple projects running and they actually stitch those together with reverse proxy. So they'll have four, four different sites running. You don't know it because all you see is the main URL, but like they've got to spread across multiple websites. Um, and so even, even to, uh, of course, before we uh, had uh, CMS scalability where you can really jump up there with the numbers. It was also a way that around that 10,000 limits, so they could have their blog post in one project and a landing page uh, generator in another project and, uh, you know, uh, products in another one. And then you can kind of uh, uh, stitch them all together with a reverse proxy. So we're talking lots of static pages, typically lots of items on the DOM, even though don't, um, and, uh, and then lots of content on that static page. Okay. And uh, what is what is the most requested thing that an enterprise client comes to you and says, I need this. And you go, we can't do that. And then they go elsewhere. Well, I'm curious what, like- They go what elsewhere? Is, yeah, no, what, is the point, do what is the point? What is the, <laughs> <laughs> what is the point where, where you go, we're not right. You're, you're, I don't know if you're too big or you, you're too, you're too this or you're too, what, I'm, I'm trying to understand what are the, what are the boundaries here of of in your opinion of webflow and they're the things inside are were great and the things outside were not like maybe you should you should uh yeah yeah i, I think this is not going to be a surprise to anybody here but i think you know webflow doesn't have a back-end ecosystem right so uh you'll have customers who come to you and they're like hey i want to include react because i have this react app and i need you know server side whatever now you can use react with webflow but it's costly because again we talk about the cost of loading things on page, you have to load React and React DOM uh, anytime you want to use a React component in Webflow. So there's that. And then previously, until we had CMS scalability, it was the other thing. And I still think you see that too, right? Sometimes I'm not going to drop any names because I don't think I'm allowed to say some things, right? But like there are really large companies who come to us who are news publications or whatever. And now their numbers are of, of articles or items are in the millions, right? Oh, a hundred million. <laughs> you know, like, uh, you know, that's uh if you just stitch together these 60 sites. We can <laughs> you where you are six thousand sites, right? Like it's <laughs> it's 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 those things that become pretty painful. And then I think. If, if we talk about it, an, another pain, which, um, you know, it, it's, it's, if you have to, uh, if you have to stitch together four sites, how do you keep those style systems in sync? It's a, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work to, to do that. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that's hard. So there's, there's a lot of talk around that too. So yeah. I think, it was uh, sorry. It was um, Nico just mentioned with your react situation that does that, is that changing with DevLink here? DevLink. So DevLink is pretty fun because how DevLink works, if you haven't seen it, DevLink was something that was announced at um, WebflowConf. And essentially what it does is allows you to design components inside of the designer. And then you actually have a, a local server running on your computer. And when you save you know, the Webflow designer and you make a change and save it, it takes that component and outputs the code into React component. And much like, so I this past year, I worked on this project with one of my heroes who he's a legend in the web, in the web animation game, like GSAP, he, he's like a magician with it. And I've always wanted to work with him. I got to work with him. And I built the site in Webflow and it's supposed to be hosted somewhere else because there were like 10 stacks coming together. It's a big team. And so 
Um, I exported the code out of Webflow and gave it to him. And he said, you write the cleanest code I've ever, like, dude, thank you. And I was like, actually. <laughs> was You're not, like, no, I spent all night making sure this was really clean for you. Not me, right? And so that's one of the things that people love about Webflow. And I hear that from like enterprise customers, their engineers on a regular basis, right? Like, oh, it's so clean. And it's the same thing with that React, those React components, like, I can't wait for everybody to get to see, but like when you see that code that it writes, you're like, that's actual React code that I would write. Like I would write that. Um, so, but that allows you to then put that in your React environment. So instead of bringing your React environment inside of Webflow, you're taking Webflow, like being able to design and taking that design flexibility and bring it into your React environment. And so uh, to take it a step further, when you talk about the Figma plugin, imagine your UX UI folks building in Figma. Oh, they don't know Webflow. It. Copy paste stop. inside of Webflow, make a component. It's now a React component. Um, and it's in an app somewhere, right? Like wow. that that's like the like wow. like that's that's where it gets fun. Figma to Webflow to React. Yeah, let's go. With just a couple clicks. With no with no code. With no code. Wow. Um. What uh, What are the biggest? What's the biggest team size you see on these projects? Ooh. Um. And what? Or uh, there's that. But then also, at what point do things start to break down? <laughs> um. I don't know if I've really seen much break down. More. Uh, if we can be depressing for a second, I've really seen more around the macro, like our economic environment, right? Like where like startups that were thriving that are like, yeah, we're closing our doors, you know? And it's like, oh, man, you know, that's not so fun. I think the biggest, the biggest thing, again, let's go back to that no code is easy mantra. I think sometimes I'm shocked by the amount of companies who, big companies who you probably use their products every day and their services every day who spend uh, money on Webflow Enterprise and invest in Webflow Enterprise and have zero internal talent and do not employ, do not have a partner who they're working with. And so they have folks who are like, yeah, I mean, I played with WordPress once or I dealt with Elementor once. So I think that we can like pick this up. And so, you know, part of my job is like, I have to make sure they're successful. So I've got to like train them up and like teach them and, and make sure that they're where So I think that's the like when we talk about like it breaks down and that's normally where I'm like, let's get them a partner. Like who's who's a who has an open book of business who can take something on right now? Uh, you know, let's let's bring them in. Uh, because uh that's really, I mean, truly, and where I love like rooms like this, so many Webflow experts in our community who are so good, right? Who can come in and literally save the day for like huge corporations who don't have this sort of knowledge or talent internally. So, wow. Um, you kind of skirted. You you mentioned these uh, design systems. I'm curious if you have any names for ones that you love. Corey, can I? Uh, I. Is it okay? Of course. Yeah. I don't. I, yo. <laughs> Corey's working on one. I love Corey's. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh so bug cory have him share yeah, it with you. you yeah i can share a link it's called cory code it's, <laughs> it's wonderful we're, we're, we're calling it mast it's gonna launch under no code supply co which is like yeah. a, a site that uh myself and then another webflow team member max lind run or built and launched i don't know a month ago three weeks ago yeah I'm sorry if you weren't ready for that to come out. Dude, no, all good, uh, all good. Here, um, here's the thing is like even mass, it's just a name. And the reality is the more people I talk to, just like you had said, Ben, when I showed it to you, is like people have been building like this for a long time. Like if even the layout system, if you've ever used or heard of Bootstrap, it's this, um, not identical, but it's almost the same thing. Like I, I would bet a lot that a lot of people in the Webflow community that haven't like gone all in on client first and things uh, already do this. And so we're just giving it a name and proper documentation and all that. So um, you're doing all yeah. the hard work. <laughs> I mean, yeah. what's funny is some of the work came from the other end that Ben's seen is like at on the brand web team I'm on at Webflow. 
uh, I help create what we call boilerplate, which is just our own like style system that we use to build all the marketing end of webflow.com. Um, and so this is like inspired by that and inspired by, again, other things from other places in the community and all that. So, yeah. If I prefer my a bit, I'll send it to you. Let me know. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I, I prefer my own system. I mean, I'm still using the style system like that. I can't like it's mine from when I was having to write code by hand. I've updated my naming conventions. I still write code by hand. And so I'm into like CSS variable naming conventions. Now, so like my naming conventions have changed a little. I think there's a big, uh, uh, and there's a big effort or movement in the Webflow community around um, naming conventions and making them very approachable for clients. And I think that's really, really good, right? Um, I will say when you're working on an enterprise website, I think you sort of have to drop that and you have to slim it down and, and flip it. It's got to be more about developer first because these aren't like a smaller business. This These are folks who are like, this is a pro environment, right? Like you're working with, with these really big logos, people who like, I'm they've got their own internal team of developers. I'm talking to a guy who wrote React until last month and they bought Webflow and now he's working in Webflow or, or uh, you know, one of our awesome customers, uh, she was, uh, she was writing ASP and HTML and CSS and, you know, now uh, working in Webflow that have that development background, right? And so you think, slim it down. It's okay to be a little complex, but uh, tight, clean, really strong, good layout system and really thinking about developer first because, it's kind of a flip to the normal where like you would build it, and hand it off to a customer. It's a little different. Are you saying short words because more letters in your CSS, like just make the file heavier than it needs to be? Or are you saying short words that aren't just because developers are comfortable with that? I don't even think it has to be short words. I'm talking about less about making it understandable to the average person who's going to look at the CSS names and, and, making it in a, in a way that cares less about that and more about the developer. So a more traditional approach to class naming conventions mm -hmm. and then just documenting it well, right? Like I think that uh, there, again, we go back to no code. Um, there's been this large push to like make everything approachable, democratize, which is what we want to do, right? But at the same time, when you're going to build a huge website, typically you're going to be working with a, a bigger company and they've got experts everywhere. They don't need you to water it down. And so really they thrive better in an environment where you sort of have that, uh, you know, developer uh, first approach. At least that's what I've seen with most of the customers that I've had the pleasure to work with. So. Which are the areas where you don't trust no code apps and or chat GD GPC with coding? Because you said you said you do a lot of your own coding still. So I'm wondering <laughs> which of the areas where you feel more comfortable, like, you know, I, I'm going to take this one. Uh, all the time I take my own, uh, right, right. Like I, I think if I have to write JavaScript or if I'm got to add some sort of interactive functionality, I, I'm going to do it myself, but I have been writing code for a while. So I have that pleasure or that, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 privilege, I guess. Um, I, 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 you know, one of my, one of my big pet peeves, I think in the no code community is especially around bigger sites I'll see somebody in community build something and it is massively successive, right? Right. Like successful. Like they have wild success, lots of users. They're pushing Webflow to its limits, but their use case isn't really made for Webflow, right? Like they're kind of, uh, I think like, uh, you know, I think one of the things like if you've worked in SaaS before, like you build a shoe, like, and Webflow is a really great shoe. It's like Air Jordan Primo, the best that you can put on. And people like to pick it up and put it on their elbow. And they're like, doesn't it look great on my elbow? And you're like, no, put it on your foot. It's for your foot. Um, you know, and so th that's sort of one of those things where it's like, hey, you, you've proven your use case. You've proven there's a market. You've got customers. Now go buy an LMS and don't like try to like game Webflow. To, like you've got 10,000 users or 15,000 users and you're relying on Zaps and no hate on Zapier, but like, whew, like that. Oh, we've hated sweat. on Zapier here before. Don't worry. We've hated on Zapier. Sweat a little bit, right? Like, I don't want my very successful business that I've proven out to be like, yes, keep Webflow, make it my marketing channel. I'm going to use it to capture my leads. But when they hit that login button, 
I'm sending them to this tool that I'm investing in because I've proved my use case. And so, you know, I will say like, I, I want to lean on experts uh, to write the code. I want to lean on the right tools, especially when you're big, building bigger websites. I think one of the things for folks who, if you do start engaging with customers who are enterprise size, do not pitch them Zapier or Make or not that they haven't heard of it or haven't listened uh, to those pitches before. But if they've done a lot of like procurement is so big inside the world of enterprise, right? Like these these folks went they went through four months of legal negotiations to and and, and uh, enterprise negotiations to buy Webflow Enterprise, and they've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, and now you're like, and you're going to use Zapier, and they're like, great. One, uh, is it enterprise skill, which, you know, uh, th they have an enterprise motion, but two, now they've got to go, like, that's four months for them to go do the same, you know, if that's their how their motion works internally, they've got to go spend another four months to vet that tool. So you really end up in a situation where you're like, what tools do you have and how can we make this work, right? And so I think a lot of things again, to Webflow having no back end, a lot of times you typically end up using middleware. So like a Xano uh, uh, or like think autocode, but like um, uh, instead like a node server instead of just autocode, right? Like you have this middleware that you hit and it's hitting all the protected endpoints. And so uh, you kind of have to, and and the other thing I would say to, to all of you, if you're going after enterprise clients, which I hope you do, and I hope you land them and I hope you're wildly successful, um, is that uh, don't be afraid to like, go for it even if you don't know it right there are people like Corey who you can hire are there are people like um there there are lots of developers out there that you can hire to do the people like i don't understand how to do that yeah there's a developer out there who knows how to do it you can hire them um you spend a little bit of the money they're paying you to hire that person and you can still do the job right so it's like validating that use case understanding how it works and and really just going for it so what's kind of interesting here is i think there's been this you know there's this knock on no code for the last few years that you start out and you're like, Oh yeah, this is the greatest tool. And then someone always comes in. They're like, yeah, but it doesn't work for enterprise. And then it's like, all right. You know? And so I feel like there's been this, this like desire for no code to like prove that no, yeah. you know, bubble, I think was like a big one. Like, no, we can do enterprise. We can scale. And it sounds like what you're kind of saying is like, screw it. Who cares? Like, no, just go use your node, you know, your node servers. Yes. There's some things like Webflow can do certain things, but not every no code tool has to, has to scale. Like certain no code tools work in certain situations and, but not a lot of them, you know, especially these middle, like the, these connector tools that you're talking about, not a lot of them really work. And so use the tool that works, but otherwise, like, let's not, let's not fight that battle of trying to prove that no code tools can just like be the, the, the solution for even the biggest clients. Yeah. And let's put it this way. Like Webflow is powering a ton of huge enterprise websites. Are they using Zapier? I'm probably not right. Like uh, I can tell you what they're using. They're using a more traditional stack um that that pairs with it right and it's less engineering resources because they kind of set it and forget it and and folks roll with it right and there's some maintenance here and there but they're not having to pull another tool into the stack and uh you know i just got back from a very first on-site with a webflow customer who i can't tell you who it is but they're very huge it's probably our biggest enterprise customer ever and the folks who were in the room driving who wanted webflow cto senior VP of engineering, right? Like it, it's not just designers who are like angling for Webflow. It's folks who write code and understand like Webflow puts out great code. Webflow helps me keep engine, like especially like now uh, it's like, hey, can I keep my engineers focused on things that matter? So like if I can keep them building the app, right? Then I don't need them to build my marketing site. Like that's time wasted for them. They don't want to build a marketing site. They want to build something, you know, more fun. They're and so they want to be engaged in this other thing. So, um, yeah. You know, Would you recommend important. memberships to a to an enterprise client? Webflow memberships. We have a couple using it. Uh, depends on your use case. What are you trying to do? I'll flip that back around on you uh, because I think I think we all know like. There, there are two pieces where Webflow memberships are still are still working towards, right? Um, and it's uh, scale. So they, they bump the users up to a 20K count. But again, if you're an enterprise customer, 
you probably, you know, you might, might need a little bit more. And I think too, when it's, we talk about like, what are the beautiful things about Alceda and, and member stack? It's being able to write data to that user object and like element level gating and stuff like that, right? Um, which is, makes them just magical to play with. You're like, what? Like the things you can do with them are really fun. And so Webflow is not there yet, uh, but it's early days, you know? I think it's one of the funny things, like I one thing I learned working in Webflow support was like we would launch something and immediately, like people would be begging for it for like, our R's here. People would be begging for it for like years, okay? And then we would release it. And the first thing people would tell us is like, we need more. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. That's we've got to stand say. up. That was another one of my questions. What's the most requested thing from enterprise customers that you don't have? The most requested thing. Um, uh, so I think uh, there are two pieces that I hear all the time. Uh, super transparent. So the first thing is, um, I talked about global CSS, global JS for a first site, right? So you have one JS bundle, one CSS bundle. But like if I have 140 pages, no matter how mean my, my, my design system is and how lean my design system is, it, it's gonna bloat a little, right? Like, and so folks want a way to kind of contain that, like only load the JavaScript I need for this page, only load the CSS I need for this page. So I hear that often. Um, you know, and I think the the other thing that I hear all the time is like, we have libraries now. Why can't I have like libraries for my like private libraries for just me that I can share across sites in my workspace? Um, so it's another thing we hear quite often. Interesting. RR, welcome. Our, I, we met, RR, I don't know if you remember, we met in at the no, at the Webflow Conf. And if I remember correctly, Ben, ben are, are you kind of a, like similar? I are, are you working with enterprise clients as well, right? Yeah, sorry. I'm uh, yeah. maybe doing double duty right now, but yeah, same thing as Ben. Oh, nice. I think this is uh, not only do we have our two first uh, uh, attendees from Mexico, Mexico City. We also, I think, have a record for Webflow employees on the call. So if anyone's got some some beef or anything they want to let out, any anything that they really want to get to, uh, you know, Webflow leadership, uh, now's your time. Corey's a good person, but he's been our he's been our messenger for a while here. So give us some dirt on Grieber. <laughs> uh, it's funny that everybody, the first thing they go, our university team, y'all, they're 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 it and. Uh, can't give you any dirt, but I can tell you that he is just as funny and kind in person as he is on those videos. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, for Ben, um, if somebody isn't at that enterprise level, um, what would you suggest are the things to focus on most so that you're sort of have the confidence and the preparation to go after a bigger client? That's really great. Um, that's a great question. I think part of it is uh, have the bravery of somebody who has too much privilege. I mean, so many times the best folks I know um, who are really talented are like, I don't, you know, they have imposter syndrome. They're like, I, I don't know if I could do this. Don't don't listen to that voice inside of yourself. Trust yourself is what I would say. Um, and then two, I think it's every uh, just like anything else. The more time you spend developing, uh, the better you're going to be. Um, and so I think that's that's the second part of the formula. I think the third part is every site you build, build it like you were building it for, you know, Disney or whoever. Like build it like it is. It is something because the truth is when you start reaching for enterprise clients, they're going to look at your work. Like they want to see great, great design. They want to see not just about like blowing us away, but like user paths and convert, like what converts, what is functional, what is accessible. They do want to see those things and having like uh, there, there is a tool out there. I don't know if you know about it, but it, 
we'll let them run sites and they can like, they'll use page speeds. They'll use this site to check how big your CSS is. And if it's blo like, they, they do all like, they're going to do their due diligence on your work. Right. So it's like, Hey, build every site. Like you're doing that uh, is, is that one. And then the last one I'd say is just don't be like, don't be afraid to learn and fail. I think so many times um, I'm not a smart man. Um, and, and uh I, what I what I would say is so many times I, I hear from people like, well, I tried to learn to code, but then like, yeah, man, it was confusing and I gave up. Do not let that impede you. If you don't know where to go to get started, I am a DM away on Twitter. I will share a million resources with you. Uh, Wes Boss has a great course um, for beginner JavaScript. Go get it, go get in and go learn. Um, go break some things, have fun. And and because the truth is, even if you don't become proficient right away, you stick with it, you're going to get there, one. And two, uh, the, even just the inklings that you pick up as you start, like you'll learn some concepts. And you're like, that's what's happening. That was that thing that one time. And like, okay, like it starts to sort of click for you. Um, and the other things that come from those courses is you really learn to debug and 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 by that really jumping into a site and you're like, why is this not working in Safari? Ooh, you know, and, and so the more you actually custom code and you play with some of those environments, and the more you build, the more you encounter those things and you practice that skill, and you just become really good. And you're like, oh, I've seen this. This is actually so far. This is the WebKit bug. I've seen this before. This is their problem, not mine, but I know I have to use Flex X way in order for this to work or else this is going to be like completely. And Safari has all kinds of bugs, but like, uh, <laughs> but but like, you know, you learn those things, you pick those things up and you learn like how, not only how you can build it to be performant, but also across multiple, uh, like all those environments, multiple browsers. So I would say those are the key pieces and and uh, you're a true blue person and you can do it. Like you got it. Um, I, I say that to everybody here, right? Like y'all can do this. And um, there's nothing that makes, like, I, here's what I, here's what I've learned in, in enterprise is what I would say. So you get into these huge companies, like I said, and a lot of them don't even have internal talent, all of this money that they make. And you realize they don't know what they're doing. Like they, they don't know they're making, they're making it up to uh, you're not, you're like, you're not out on your own here. Right. So it's like, have that courage and really practice those skills and, and go get it. That's what I would say. I think we just got a YouTube short there. Uh, that last <laughs> <laughs> also charge more money whatever you're charging it's not enough that, that's the other thing i would say keep charging more money so do you think that kind of piggybacking on what penny's getting at here do you think that the the motivations or the or like the the things that enterprise clients are looking for um i think i know the answer to this but like do you think they're looking for different things than a small client and what i mean by that probably is more do you think that smaller clients are like, ooh, that looked pretty. And you made a really pretty site that had things move around on the page in a way that was really pleasing. And as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, it turns more into like, oh, that site was accessible, fast, and had a really good you, you know, UI patterns or so, you know, UX. Or so. And there's some brands who their whole personality is like, let's go fast and, and break things. And we want to be like this loud. We want animations everywhere. Like, there are times when it's like, yeah, like if I want to get this customer, I'm going to have to do it. I think more than anything, like the term that gets thrown around in corporate America is executive presence, right? And what does that really mean? A human connection. They they want someone they can trust, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's about telling your story and having the work to back it up, right? So if you do good work and you have good references, and you build trust into folks. I mean, listen, there, I work with enterprise customers, big enterprise customers who work with one and two man shops that are Webflow experts. You can do it, right? Like you can do it. You can always contract if you need more help. You can always lean on it. But like, uh, you know, uh, I would just say the biggest thing is, uh, you know, I, I managed a lot in my career and a lot of people are like, what well, makes a good manager? I'm like, you have to give a damn. Right. Like you really do have to, you have to care about people and that's what makes a good manager. Right. And, and it's the same with business. They want, they want to know that you care, not, 
not uh, uh, Matt from 8020, uh, one of my good friends. And uh, I don't know if anybody here has chatted with him, but one of the things that one of their principles is they're going to guide and advise your company like it's their company. They take that sort of care, right? Like if they give you advice, it's the it's the thing that they would do, right? And they it is sincere, um, uh, treating people the right way. And I think that connects that connects with folks. And so uh, I think the easiest way to start winning some of those deals and what are they looking for? Looking for someone they can trust. So you know, even practicing your sales skills. So maybe that's a fun meetup uh, a project at some point where people get to fake scopes and get to pitch to each other. But like, you know, understanding what a customer is about and and not just who they are, but also their business goals, right? At, in the end of the day, capitalism, love it or hate it, um, people are out to make money, right? They have a they have an end goal and they want to know that you understand that. So that, that one to two person shop that's working with the enterprise client, right. Suppose this probably depends on the deal and the site and all the stuff, but is there bandwidth there or for them, those two people to have multiple enterprise clients or do it? I assume that enterprise clients are taking up a lion's share of your, of your, your working hours. Yeah, I think again, depends on the client, how good you are at managing project and keeping things in scope. Right. I think the best freelancers, the best agencies they know how to prevent scope creep, right? It's like, hey, nope, we didn't talk about this, right? Like we're on point, let's stay on point. You wanna do that? We can negotiate, we can negotiate again, put together another contract and we'll tackle that afterwards, right? And I think keeping people on track, but I think that's the beauty of Webflow is that, yeah, I mean, you're not having to develop this by hand and write all the code and commit it and run a, like, it's also, uh, it, the, it's a double-edged sword because you're going, oh, that's, that's just another page. I'll, yeah, we'll throw, yeah, no, but no. And so it's, it's you, cause you know how quick it can be. Yeah. And so sometimes to prevent scope creep, you're like, well, that's like 30 minutes, you know, but it's like, no, don't do that. Do yeah, you know that. what I mean? Like I'm in a situation <laughs> literally right now where I'm thinking to myself, dang it, this is, this has gone up like two X. Yes. And it's not even a web flow site. It's a, it's a different project, but yeah, it's. Yeah, you know, little, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts, as they say, you know. Oh, a hundred percent. And I think like when you think about it and in like you're thinking about like how you approach it, it's really, I mean, the good news is again, you're charging to whatever you're charging, you're not charging enough. And I like I don't even know what you charge for a site, but you I promise you, you're not charging enough. Charge more money. And the beauty of working with enterprise customers, I think it's it, and it's the difference. People are like, I'm scared to charge that much money. When you work with a small business. That's their money and they care. They're going to hold you. The hardest customer to work with is a small business because they're going to get every penny that they spend out of you. Promise you. When you work with an enterprise customer, you know what phrase you'll hear every once in a while? Not my money. I don't care. Uh, and and because it's not like they work there, they're going to be frugal with their company's money, but like they know they got to spend to get talent. So they're going to spend to get talent. Right. And so charge more money. <laughs> like, Go get that. And because, and the cool thing is by charging more money, you can have fewer clients instead of having to chase and do, you know, a hundred projects a year, do 12 really great ones, do eight really great ones. Like, I don't, however you want, you know, you got to do all the freelancer math yourself or the, or the agency math on like what you need to make. But like, I'm here to tell you if I grew up in Podunk, Oklahoma with zero money uh, and I figured it out, like if, <laughs> You can too. I am not special. Right. And so I think that's the thing folks really, I hope they grasp is like, you can do it. Go charge more money and go get those folks. Cause, and the more you charge and the more projects you get like that, the, you'll be shocked by how many more you get. Go ahead, Penny. Uh, what do you consider or what is an enterprise client? Is it a, a cost factor? Is it a size of project factor? Is it a size of the business? What's the What's, what are the guidelines around that? That is the great question. Um, it, it, comes, it comes at you from multiple angles. So uh, any SaaS company you work with is going to segment you by the size. So how many employees you have, you'll have, you'll, you'll be a different level of enterprise. So there are different tiers. So, you know, 250 plus, or, you know, you have more than 2000 or, you know, you're 10,000 and above, you know, you'll have, you'll have segments there. Then you'll also have by project need, like sometimes you'll have customers come in and they're like, 
I, I've got to have 80,000 items. And I know a lot of people in the community were upset that Webflow didn't go 10,000 plus for everyone, right? But I think you have to understand, like, again, the majority of Webflow sites are less than 500 CMS items, like 98 point whatever, like, there are not many sites with a lot of CMS items, right? So when you need them, you're paying for them, like you need them. So it's like that need, or even like CD and bandwidth, some folks like they have so much traffic and they use so much bandwidth that like it, it requires a, a move up to enterprise just because of the cost of hosting that project. So there are like a few different things that can play a factor, but the number one thing is typically like segment. How many people are working at that company? I, I'm, I know I feel like we've got some Webflow uh, developers on the line here that are probably charging clients. I'm curious, um, and if you don't, if you don't want to, or throw it in the chat or something, but uh, if you don't want to say, don't say. I'm. What is like a range? Like I, I'm curious, top end range and a bottom end range for what you would charge for like a marketing. Now we're not talking enterprise. Not talking enterprise here. I'm just curious, like what's the range that you charge for a web flow site? Um, Cause I, I, I don't know if, if people like, we've all, you know, it probably depends on where you live. It depends on the client. It depends on your, like the type of it, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm kind of curious. Um, I can go first. I can share if anyone else if, to, I would say that a small site that isn't too, I, what you eat also depends on how hungry you are. And so, uh, you know, if you really are hungry, you probably are willing to charge less. But, uh, you know, I would say the smallest site that I would I would do would be like $5,000. And the biggest site that I would ever want to take on because I've got a full-time job elsewhere would probably be, would, would probably charge like twenty dollars to $25,000. That's kind of my range. If someone wants a six-figure site, as much as I would love to take that on and tackle it, I'm probably not your guy. Like I would send it to someone else. So um, I'm just kind of curious if that, I might be totally wrong. I might be like way high for some people. I might be way lower, but I have no idea what other Webflow developers charge. Just kind of throwing it up. We can also cut this from the video if people <laughs> are comfortable. Right. We're not good ranges. It's fine, right? I, I, uh, yeah, I would say, and like I saw Penny in the chat said five to 15. Like, okay, I don't think that's unreasonable. It 100% is location based, too. Uh, I've definitely talked to a lot of people in the community that are in South America or South Africa or, you know, even over in Europe and, and Asia that like it is very different in prices, yeah. but like US based. That's, I mean, that's what I've observed is like, five is a minimum I would say for for most um and it needs to be pretty simple all but then I would say that the other end is yeah may, you may not take it on yourself Kyle but like definitely there's agencies and studios yeah. that are building sites well into the six oh. figures you oh, know yeah, yeah, yeah. and then what's wild about that is like at least in some that I've been involved with in my own freelance life and or just fit people that I know of is like that can still be on the cheap end for like, once you get to that big of a site that would otherwise be also sending RFPs to like WordPress shops or traditional dev shops that are kind of custom build it, right? Like that are gonna have like multiple engineers building one site where some of these teams can do it with like a designer and a Webflow developer, right? Uh, so that's that's what's, what's interesting. And like, I think one other quick thing I wanted to note is like back, to Ben and uh, conversation earlier, and then even what Penny had asked around, just like even code itself. And I think to me, like I realize I'm preaching in the choir, but this is exactly why and where Webflow sits as a different and more powerful tool than so many others in the market is because of that code parity. That like I'm sorry, <laughs> I'll you know like that. And it, this is just an example. Uh, Framer, you know, is like in the market and all the hot rage. Like I can't go sell a hundred thousand dollar framer site. I just can't because like if it's a hundred thousand dollar site, there will be an engineering team involved. I promise you that. Like that's not just going to be anybody mom and pop shop spending that much, right? And then once there's an engineering team involved, they're going to care about all the things Ben was just talking about: systems and code cleanliness and how easily you can integrate with all these other systems 
or the CMS API and like all these things that are like when comparing tools so easy to just glaze over. Uh, but they are so fundamental to like actually selling and, and building like powerful extensible sites. And I think like even one other comment that came up earlier and Kyle, you mentioned like there's different tools for different jobs. And to me, again, my opinion or my observation of like why the Webflow community gets so hyped is that there's such a broad spectrum that can be served. Like you can learn the basics and build a landing page for, you know, a candy shop or something simple all the way up to what Ben's describing these like enterprise multi-project reverse proxy integrated programmatic SEO, whatever fancy engineering terms you want to throw at it, it can be done. And yes, there is limits, but the point is that the limit is higher than most other like no code level tools. And so like, it just sits in this like spectrum. Right. And I think the last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop ranting <laughs> is the other thing that I've observed, especially in the last couple of years in this whole range and where all of us like maybe have a little bit of value and, and power is traditional, especially like there were some people in here that have been at this for a long time. Front end developer, as it was, I'm getting a little feedback. I don't know. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, front end developer, as it was, you know, 10 years ago or more, was like, you know, HTML, CSS, some JavaScript. A front end developer now, at least, and please somebody correct me if I'm off in this, uh, you know, is is much more full stack. Is, is has been my observation. So. Front end developers traditionally now are using React and Vue oh, and Angular really? and all the, you know, and they're they're interweaving data and like this is now not, you know, so they've 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 walked away from the front front end is what I always refer to as now. And they're like, in my opinion, they're like middle end developers, right? And then the, you know, software engineers are still like, you know, or back end are still definitely doing kind of what I've at least observed, you know, what they've always done. And so like especially my last full-time job before I joined Webflow, we lost two developers that did front end websites and then email because I'm like, this is, that's where it's weird to say because of Webflow, like we brought Webflow on, like we just didn't need three people to build sites anymore. Like we could do it with one or two, you know? And so like one of them started just doing fully email. And so like, yeah, just wanted to note that like the industry has changed. And so like Webflow and no code is filling a gap that I think we just don't talk about very often um, mm -hmm. that that is present because of the way the engineering and development world has moved. Right. So in, in yeah. a way, you've got designers that are now able to bleed into the like the what was front end. Right. right? Exactly. And now the yep. front end is moving more into this data layer. And mm -hmm. so it's not just presentation anymore. That's, it's kind of interesting. It's, yeah. it's forcing yeah. front end, front end developers to kind of level up. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And the one thing I would say when we talk about pricing, if you have the means, find something really cool you can work on every year that will make a difference. And if you can do it for nothing, yes. um, <laughs> there is nothing better than finding an organization that does great work in your community and just upping their game. Uh, make you feel really good. And then the other thing I would say about pricing, though, there is an exception to the rule. If there's a brand, local brand, regional brand, whatever, that you just love, you love their style, you love their voice, you're like, that would just be my dream project. Forget it. As long as it's not taking you into the negative to work on that project, right? Uh, you will get so much joy and energy and it keeps you moving between the projects where you're like, I'm doing this because I'm getting paid. So uh, I would say that those two things are important too when you think about picking up projects. I got a buddy who's a designer and he does it for a local brewery in town. He like does all their cans. Like they're like, they'll come out with new flavors and stuff. So he much loves fun. it. And he shows up and he like delivers their new designs and they just like load them up with beer and it's great. You know? <laughs> what, how amazing. Right? Yeah. Sign me up for that job. <laughs> right. It's, Do they need a website. I actually very, very recently in the last couple of weeks learned the term CSR, corporate social responsibility, which apparently is a very well-known term across massive corporate organizations where they have a budget that's specifically supposed to go to like philanthropic charitable causes that are for the public good, usually as a PR stunt, but also just as a general way to try and run things a bit better. It made me wonder if like Webflow does anything like that. Do they build websites for people just kind of off the cuff right now? 
we don't do any hands-on work, but there are a couple things that we do have. We do have discounts for nonprofits. Um, and mm -hmm. Vlad has been very kind over the years and generous with offering hosting for uh, in, in different situations, social situations that have arisen or global situations, um, which is uh, which has been very great. And then two, there is the community grants program. So if you are making Webflow content, if you're doing cool Webflow work for the community, there's um, there's money there too as well. So yeah, yeah. Gosh, I haven't been thinking about that community grant program for a while, actually. I know No Code North have something up their sleeves that they're keeping hush hush. Oh, but I decided I to um, not keep hush hush right now. Just kidding. You don't have to talk about it. <laughs> It's it's not really hush hush. We got a grant, but we haven't actually figured out exactly how we're using it yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This is actually, you know, this is this is Twin Cities Webflow. But what we like to do is invite people on and then put them on the spot, you know, and uh, <laughs> put them on the spot, you know, give them feedback on their employers, you know, you know. We keep it real here. <laughs> I think I think it would be so rad. I had, I had tweeted this in December. I took December off from freelance work. And I ironically, as Ben was even just saying you should do, I was like helping local places. And I was like, how rad it would be if the whole community just like embraced like one month of the year where it's just like everybody take at least one project that is for a nonprofit or some organization that like makes a difference in the world. Because like, I think that's the other thing with the Webflow community that I have found so incredibly refreshing. And again, I know that I'm preaching to the choir is like <laughs> the openness to like help each other. Like the web development world is a pretty damn intimidating world uh, in terms of like getting hazed on Stack Overflow or, you know, do like documentation that seems like it's almost intentionally written to make it so hard to read and understand that like it's trying to gatekeep knowledge and again i know that i'm being dramatic but the point is that like i think that's where people have getting gotten so drawn into like no code in general like not even just webflow like uh you know jeremy mentioned xano and like other tools like that like it's just incredible how open people are to help everyone learn and then how can we like pass that learning off to like again organizations that could benefit from it uh in terms of like a website or content management and that kind of stuff so i don't know or what if we all picked one or two organizations and we just, as a group, really treated them right? Uh, you know, <laughs> like that would be fun uh, to get to to tag team and collaborate on stuff too. We'll, so we'll use Ben's enterprise branching access so we can all build pages at the same <laughs> time too. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I work, my day job is I, I work in marketing at a uh, software company that does uh, database software for nonprofits called uh, donor perfect uh and uh you would not believe how many uh, organizations out there are just screaming for someone to take that website they have that you know some of them like you know we were talking about front page earlier some of them were honestly created in front page 15 20 years ago and they're still running like that and they want to be taken up that next level uh yeah. and this would just rock their world wow yes i also i don't know about anybody else but i think as soon as you start to kind of dive into the web world and appreciate it bad websites start to cause you like physical pain when you look at them so I, I'm currently helping my auntie create a Webflow website for her community bookstore because she shared this with me about six months ago. She was really excited about it. She runs this community bookstore and she was like, check it out. This is our website. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, I think the hardest thing I've ever done working at Webflow is like sometimes as an example to teach people internally or like. Uh, when we are are hiring people, like you're kind of trying to figure out what their knowledge is. So you build sites that are broken so that they can diagnose them and trying to build a broken site. You're like, <laughs> like is, give me an example. There, How would you break a site? Like you would just, the styling would be off or what would you do? Uh, yeah. Use the styling wrong, set uh, inputs to autofocus, uh, you know, put in some custom code and don't close tags. Um, you know, Use uh, iframe. 
Yeah, like just every <laughs> yes, everything that you can think right. of that is like I like to use code that prevented the default action on a form. It's like, why is the form not submitting? I don't know. Uh, hope you can debug and find that code that's telling it not to submit, right? So just like going through and doing all these, and honestly, it feels cruel uh, looking at it in, in retrospect, but. Uh, but like trying to build something that's broken, even like when you're trying to like break it for a good, you're like, oh man, this hurts my soul to break this. <laughs> you, so do you have like a library of broken websites for trading purposes? Yeah, I I used to build <laughs> them every three months. So I've got a long list of them. That's awesome. It sounds so miserable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This month, I've got to build another broken site. <laughs> it really does. It hurts you on the inside. You're building it and you're like, oh, I hate this. I need to find some other site to build to like sort of like cleanse my palate because uh, this was awful. And then, they, and then they successfully debug it and fix it. And you have to just like reverse the changes, go back to the broken backup. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So the, the interesting thing that I or the like the thing I run into, I don't know if this is interesting or not, but. The thing that I run into that uh, I don't know if it like prevents me from doing stuff, but I'm not like, a, I'm not a talented designer. And so if there's like a, if there's a local nonprofit or someone needs help and they're like, and like, I could build their site. Right. But this, the thought of like sitting down and finding a, someone to design it, I'm like, I don't want to do it because I'm, I know it's not going to be very good and it's going to take me a lot of time and it's going to be hard, but then like going to like a design friend, I've got a few, you know, designers that I like work with on projects and be like, Hey dude. So there's this like free project. Are you willing to design it? You know, like that's not interesting to a lot of, you know, I should probably like throw it out into the ether and someone would probably jump on it. But I, that's always the thing I run into. And I'm sure there's designers out there who are like, Hey, I really like to design, but I'm not as good at the development side of it. Like mm -hmm. I know I could, but that's not my forte. And so it's almost like finding these people, like finding complementary skill sets to you where it doesn't drain your energy and it can be something that gives you energy. And then you can, the, the places that drain you, you can find other people to do those things. Cause I, ru yeah. I run into that all the time. Like if I see a great site, I'm like, Oh, I'd love to design that. But I know I couldn't, I'm not going to design it on my own. I'm a DM away. Yeah. I will always team up with you. Uh, I'm no Corey, uh, but like uh, I'll design a little, like, I, I think that, I think you're exactly right though. It's like, that's, I, and going back to what Corey said earlier, I think that's the thing I love most about the Webflow community. You can go on Twitter and be like, hey, thinking about doing this thing for like this org that does really great, like you'll get responses. Like, and that's what I love about this crew of people that that make up this community is that folks care. And uh, I, I think that that's, uh, I love it so much because uh, building things before and working the traditional development community, I can't tell you, how many times I felt like someone was gatekeeping me or I felt scolded or whatever uh, for not knowing something and being a part of this community and not even none of that existing when I ask a, a really dumb question. But also on top of that, like when you are like, hey, I'm going to put out the call. I need some help. Um, and the 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 willingness of people to just jump in and assist is just wonderful. I, I love it. And would you still do client like client revisions and meet with the, like obviously you don't want to be like here's your site and this is what you're getting like you you want to have some feedback yeah. but also you don't want to get to the point where it's like all right we've like we this started out and it was fun and now we've just this is like the fourth time we've got you know like i think that's right. where you like you have to and uh, this would be a fun session we should get somebody from some of these agencies in here to do scoping work and who are great at scoping. Uh, I, like there are people who are so good. Like I, I used to, I used to do like lots of art stuff and like in Las Vegas, I'd play music and like do all these things. And like uh, had this producer who would always come and tell you everything you did wrong. And I loved him. And he would tell me how terrible I was. And I'd walk away from the conversation and be like, God, Chris is great. Uh, and <laughs> like some people just have that touch. Like, I think it really comes from like setting expectation and scope ahead of time. Like 
we want you to have what you want. So we're going to give you like two revisions, but like, we can't go outside of that. Right. So like, if it, if it doesn't fit, we'll, you know, we'll ship it and then maybe we can iterate later. Um, so like having that sort of presence on a project like that is super important to where it's like, Hey, not going to let you run me over, but at the same time, like I'm here to help you. So it's like trying to like, there is nothing more important uh, to me than like good PMs and good people who can run a project and keep things tight and on. Cause they're the worst thing is you work on some huge project and like my role now, most of the time is I get called in to write code. I spend more time writing code than I do anything. Like when I work on Webflow projects. And so I'll get called in to write code and I'll write all of this JavaScript in like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lines of JavaScript. And then someone will come in with like a change the next day. And I, I'm like looking at the PM like, yo, <laughs> what? Like, what are, what are we doing? Like, uh, what happened? So like, yeah, I think that's important. I know that look. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, Rachel, what? <laughs> it was the client, I swear. <laughs> oh. I, I'm curious, are many of you guys uh, charging a monthly, like a retainer fee or, uh, uh, you know, Staying in the game for longer, just the one time website creation? That's a great question. I would say that, um, speaking for myself, I do. Um, in my experience, I've found that websites are never done, and there's always someone who forgets a login or needs a new employee take you know put up taken down a new bill you know whatever it is and oftentimes even though webflow is super easy to use people just they want to do their job and they want to email me and say yeah this person left and it's not in my personality to say uh sorry um i don't do that you know and i don't also want to track my time to be like hey so i spent 15 minutes on your site um and you know so i do a i do a monthly fee a monthly retainer. Um, I think it's it. And then that also covers, I just pay for all the web flow hosting. And so I, I cover that for all my clients and then, you know, do light support. And I want to say, I can't remember. I started out and I was like, <clears throat> I'm going to charge $50 a month. And I felt like I was robbing people. And then I've probably gotten up to the point now where it's, I don't even know what it is, 200 bucks a month or something. Mm -hmm. And you figure it out, you know, for me, at least my calculus is like, if I spend like five hours or so throughout the year, it probably nets out to be about the same is kind of, I don't know, but I'm curious what other people say. Um, for me, I've uh, done hourly, like, okay, here's how much I charge for building a site. And then you need more work in the future. Cause there, this would be obviously not web flow uh, connected, but, uh, uh, you know, they'd be doing all their hosting and doing that sort of stuff on their own. And if they need me to come in to do work, I'll just, okay, yeah, that'll take me three hours to do whatever that changes. Uh, that'll be so much, you know. Yep. Yep. How about, how about SEO? Are you most of you incorporating SEO with uh, your, your websites or are you just leaving that alone? I think a lot of SEO is good development practice. Truthfully, yeah. it, like if you mm -hmm. are doing basic SEO stuff, like alt tags and good heading structure, then you're like kind of doing a poor job of the base product. But then SEO is like kind of funny as a, as a, as a line item in a scope, but it can be this big and it can be this big and it can be this big and you can make it kind of be a rolling basis, something that you optimize over time or something that is like limited to the technical aspects that you can knock out in a day or two. So it's kind of funny to, to try and define in that way, I think, but I don't know what anybody else thinks. Yeah, that's, that's, I always tell clients that like, it's all about, it's much more about content than any like finagling I can do on my end. Like I have a, a site that covers many of these spectrums in terms of just like, it is a nonprofit and I helped build their site like two years ago but they have a copywriter that writes blog posts and, and case studies and stuff like regularly and their SEO traffic or their organic traffic is like 10 X in two years. 
and I have done zero things to that site technically to change SEO impact. It's just built in a way that like, you know, she can update meta tags and, and all that kind of stuff and can do her own keyword research and, and implement that herself. Like there is no magic sauce to it, in my opinion. So I don't charge for it. And I think like my, I, for any freelance clients I've taken on on my own, which candidly, like majority of my freelance work has always been through studios or agencies, but I am jaded from the traditional approach, which like made a lot of sense in World WordPress days. Like when I did WordPress sites back in the day, it made sense to charge a retainer because there was genuinely maintenance and stuff. But now with like Webflow, there's genuinely not. <laughs> and I feel really bad. And I actually just want to fight that stigma of like, you don't need, I don't need to charge you $500 a month for me to do nothing. Um, and just to give you that peace of mind. And so like, again, I'm not, I'm not against that. Like even to Kyle's point, like there's stuff that happens. So I think it's like, it's, it's basis on the client itself. Like if you think the client will need to iterate and need like quite a bit of handholding, but I think the, the beauty of it is the majority of clients that don't need that. And they're just like, even it's a business site that goes up again, they're adding blog posts and not much else. Like it is incredible that like, I can just like do it and not talk to that client for a year and then come back and again, see that growth and not have to worry about any of that, all, all those things mm -hmm. in, the, in the meantime. Um, so I, I'm just definitely in the camp of like, I, I try to actually say, I don't, I don't charge a retainer and like, I'll just take some extra out of the initial fee, uh, uh just to fight the stigma of like that, that stuff. Like it literally pains me, especially in the nonprofit world where I saw like this nonprofit was being charged $500 a month for a site that was like not responsive, just archaic. They couldn't even update it. And it was all for hosting and maintenance fees. And it's like, yeah. I'm, I would bet a lot of money that that's still pretty common in this day and age. So super common. I don't know. I, I'm yeah, when this. I started with Webflow, that was the thing. Uh, I was doing, dealing with entertainment industry stuff. So I was dealing with actors and, and people. And it was, it was all about empowering people to take care of their own stuff so they didn't have to pay that. And so that was kind of, that's kind of been how I kind of got into it. And so... I do have the same kind of thing where it's just like, I don't have to do anything. I have, I have clients who have had sites for years. I have not touched them. They operate as well as they did the, the, you know, when they were made and yes, some have added content to them. Some have not, but there's nothing functionally that went wrong with the site and is ever going to go wrong with the site because, and so I think a lot of it has to do with like, build this stuff for like right first time and like with good structure and all of those things that we've been talking about and then it just they just last the test of time and you know, I mean obviously you know I'm I'm in the Kyle boat where I'm not a great designer so I'm not gonna like be like I'll come redesign your site for you like if you get to that point it's just kind of like you know we probably need to uh, bring in a designer for that but but yeah I mean functionally the that's why, yeah, I stopped and I even stopped with hosting of, of like, I was originally doing like hosting for other people. And I'm like, no, you get your own hosting. It's just cleaner this way and everything like that. So oh, that's so kind you of have all thing. of your clients just have their own hosting. Yeah. Oh, wow. I do the same thing. I finished a project. I used to do quarterly retainer. And then I was like, no, I won't. Cause I would have people, char I would charge them for a bucket of hours. And so like you would pay for a quarter and use the hours. And like Corey, I got to where like, and Jeremy, I just were, I literally Webflow updated the render engine, like where you have these old websites from 2014 that would literally quit working if you didn't republish them. I have customer sites that they don't have dynamic content. It's just a brochure page. And I had to go republish like seven or eight sites that haven't been touched. Uh, and that was before I was handing them off. But now I'm like, I build your site. I don't want it. It's in your workspace. I'm not, I don't want it in my space. I don't want to be responsible for the hosting. I don't, I want you to pay me and I want to go out the door. So um, you guys don't, and, and maybe you just charge them hourly or whatever, but I always get people who come back and they're like, yeah, but now, okay. So we just launched and we haven't done anything to our site, but now I want to, I want to book a two hour meeting so that we can talk about X, Y, and Z. And because Restore. you're my web guy, 
Yeah, yeah, but because you're my web guy, I would just I want to have this conversation <laughs> free and I want to do that, you know. And so I'm just like, look, you're gonna come back, you're gonna ask questions, all this stuff. You don't have people once you hand it off, you're you found that you're like you're and maybe I'm just not I like record the video and I'm like, here's where here's how you use the design, you know, the editor and all I do all the stuff and I hand it off, and then they always still come back to me and maybe it's just i'm so likable or something can i, can I go back <laughs> to the thing that's it that's what i was gonna say that's the difference it's just kyle they just won't hang out you're that's, you're, yeah. you're magnetic well, yeah, yeah. i, I want to go back to the thing that i said earlier which is like <laughs> the worst customer are the small business customers but because of that it's and so I, clientele it's it, it, clientele. and it that's one of the reasons like the more you charge like it, that's why like if you get the mindset of like i'm not taking a project if it's under 20k and like at first you're like oh boy like these are not really coming to me, but like you'll land one and then it's like referral, referral. And when they come back to you, that customer knows they're paying, right? They're like, hey, can I book, I'm booking meeting. Like, here's what I need to do. And it's like, great, let me put a scope of work together, um, you know, a state or a statement of work and let's get an estimate in your hands. And then like, when they come back to me, they're coming back to me for that, right? Um, that's normally my customer. Uh, from an SEO standpoint, I'm will also don't charge. The only time I charge extra for SEOs if they want me to write schema uh, to go with every page. I'm going to charge you for making me do that. Uh, otherwise, no charge. I put it as an add-on if they want like local search stuff, and then we're digging into like Yelp and Google and all that. Um, I also I'll say like, hey, um, Ben, close your ears. But I'll say like, hey, we'll we'll do like the Google analytics and we'll just like throw on the base analytics on there. But don't do I don't do anything. You know, if you want X, if you want like keyword research and you want to have like a real content strategy, all that. OK, that's a different thing. We're going to charge more for that. Just building the site. Nice. No, I don't do it. I don't charge extra for for that to pile onto the are, are any part. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. Are any of you using SEMrush to see what the competitors uh, of these businesses are doing as far as their, you know, like their keywords and so forth? No. I don't want to be any part of that because then they want to know why, like, again, I think Corey hit the nail on the head. Having the right content and, and putting that, like, that's, and having the right structure, that's the key, right? Like, I don't want to be a part of your, like, I want to build your site. That's your problem. Uh, it, and I see that because I am not a writer. Now, if writing is your strength, I can see where it's like, I'm going to charge money and I'm going to help these folks out. So I think it really depends on like where your strength. Personally, I am inept in that category. So I'm like, I'm going to just see myself out the door. Well, to I've your got point, a, I got point, a friend Kyle. that knows that stuff sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. To your point, Kyle, I think I've had so few that it's like I charge hourly. It, like if somebody comes back or something like that, it just doesn't... <laughs> And I do have a, like, there's an ongoing client that I have that's like, we just do keep doing work on, on the site. So there is that kind of going, but um, I actually really like the whole thing of, I think maybe it's like liking to work on multiple different projects, but it's like, I like hopping, finishing and, um, you know, being done. And so I like work really doing the white label stuff for agencies is I've been enjoying a lot. Um, and that's because it's just like in and out in less than a month, in most cases, a couple weeks and it's like done quick and, and stuff like that. So white, white label stuff for agencies. So you've created like a, a template site and then you white label it for. No, I just work. I, I just work for different agencies and they, oh, oh, I, I don't, I don't get That's to amazing, share that bro. work or any of that kind of stuff. So there's the double-edged sword to that, of course, but you know, it's been a great way of actually being able to really push the envelope and what I can do as a developer, because it's like, they bring me this thing. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's why. Matt's in the house. Thanks for joining Matt. But so Woo! where do you find your, your, uh, Jeremy, your, like you, all of your agency clients, you just have like a lineup of a Rolodex of people that you just kind of have relationships with and they know to reach out to you. I don't, I don't have that many of them, but I've been working consistently with one agency that just keeps coming back. Um, so 
that's that's kind of what I've got going right now. I'm looking. I I'm one of those people that needs to like majorly revamp my own site. And Kyle, to your point, is like because I'm not a designer, that is becoming the hardest thing. And like even just figuring out like what I want to do with that is just kind of one of those um, those things. But I've been working with uh, a designer, Brianna Nicole. Um, on my country everywhere site, and uh, and that's been an awesome experience. I really enjoy working, pairing up with designers and stuff. This is a uh, strong yeah. closing period here. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> um, I I've actually really I've really enjoyed this discussion. I don't think it's, we, we don't dip in as we talk about no code and all this stuff. We don't dip into like running an agency or pricing or all that often. So this is a good, I think this is good conversation. Also, Ben, I told, I did promise you at the beginning that this was going to either evolve or devolve. We were going to talk about everything. And so far we've talked about the biggest web flow sites in the world, all the way down to free web flow sites that are just one page. We've covered everything in the middle. So this is, uh, I think it's lived up to its billing as, as they say. Woo! Matt's into Amazing. It. We got there. <laughs> we got there. Um, I also want to be uh, respectful of time. Um, we are, we're, as, as we like to do, we like to chat. So, um, but if anyone, I know we've got, um, we've got, we've gone, we've gone over a little bit, but um, I also don't want to cut off the conversation. So if there's anything that anyone wants to uh, chat about, um, also understand that we've well, got I that. I say that you look really nice today. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Uh, for actually, uh, I just wanted to thank you, everyone. Yeah, I think this conversation was really good. So uh, I, I feel like that everything we discussed, like, kind of relates me because I am, uh, like, uh, I do code custom websites. Like, uh, as you said, now people are becoming a front end developer. So I call myself front end UI developer to just. Uh, make a bit different from them because I don't do a lot of JavaScript React, but I do know those things. I uh, People ask me that, can you do a React? I say, yeah, I can. I can build you a component library, but I won't do any integrations. So that's who I am. But when I came to the Webflow, uh, I came to know about the Webflow. I wanted to learn it, but uh, as I was working in the company, they uh, had no uh, like uh, idea what it is. So I never get a chance. Then I just, I was doing freelance with the client. I got an opportunity. I just joined him, and then I uh, introduced him with uh, Webflow. And then I started building a website in Webflow from I think I'm doing for the last two months. It's been like really, really fun. Uh, uh, the thing Corey, Corey, uh, I think shared one um, design system he's building, and I just watched it, and I it just really it connects with the Webflow design because the way he is designing it. it completely make sure so those kind of things uh, you can understand what in webflow uh, there is and as well as yeah uh, that, that's great and yeah last time i checked uh, like i saw Corey, his mouse what uh, mouse was not working so i'm not sure is, is it working now fine or not on a video and the university uh, i was uh, watching and and uh, yeah about uh, uh, the the uh, naming conventions and the design system right so in that part, I, I can add one point is that uh, I follow the BEM, I think block element and modifier because Webflow gives really nice uh, uh, opportunity to add classes and uh, manage them. So I also use that uh, convention. And as well as uh, I also like to have a design system. The main reason for that is if we have those kind of things and have a, a little document about our website or whatever project we're working on, in future, if you are uh, moving, I'm uh, like, <laughs> uh, the hell? I remember when I had my first beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Please continue. No, it, it, it's fine. It's fine. I think he's enjoying. So, um, yeah. So I was saying that uh, it, um, uh, the little document about things you've done. Uh, if you just pass on to some other developer to work on that website, he know what it is, like what to do, what to not, right? So the design system and the naming conventions are really, really uh, helpful to structure websites and all. And yeah, I'm new to this. I am not charging clients for right now as I am working with the one uh, client directly uh, on a monthly payment basis. So 
but I think uh, all of the um, links you guys have shared and the information you've shared, uh, shared was really helpful to me. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the uh, great work. So yeah, thank you guys. Parth, we're really glad you're here. Thank you for coming. We always, we always, uh, we're, we always love uh, seeing familiar faces. So if you ever want to come back, we'd love to have you back. Even though you're That's new to this whole Webflow thing. In a couple I'm, months, I'm, won't be so yeah, I'm, I'm new to it, but I, I'm loving it. I'm loving it as uh, uh, Ben shared the uh, share one uh, experience that he developed a site and then he, I think, extracted a code and someone said that you write a very clean uh, HTML or uh, like the code. I think that's that's a really great thing about Webflow. Until you are not using any plugin which can say what kind of uh, pro, like what kind of uh, technologies are used on that website, you won't know it is built on a Webflow, right? And that that clean uh, uh, the Webflow writes the code, so I am loving it. So yeah, absolutely, I I like to join uh, any other events as well. Corey just dropped you another link the way that he does to useful things. Yeah, and if any if anybody wants like even that as to play around with, just like message me or email me, uh, and I can send you a, a clone of it. But I mean, the part that's amazing. Like, and, and the thing I wanted to encourage you with too is like, uh, if if you do find it interesting, and clearly you already know HTML and CSS and even JavaScript, like. I get extra excited when people of your skills get into the community because I think it's just all the more power that can be had because like not only can you just directly help clients and things but even helping other people in the community uh, to do things that are more technical or just the other side of like then you know figuring out Webflow to the point that you can integrate it with other tools. Um, like I think candidly internally at Webflow I've been advocating and I would say Ben would back me on this of just like, I think we're missing an entire spectrum of audience that are developers that if, if I can be as clear as possible, they will not use Webflow to just completely replace everything they do. Instead, they will use it what you were just describing, Parth, like maybe as a quicker, more efficient way to create clean HTML and CSS that they export and then use somewhere else. Like in my previous full-time job, I used Webflow that way. And then we built Angular web apps on top of all the front end HTML and CSS that I created in Webflow first, just cause it was way faster, right? Um, and then the other side of like, at the beginning of the chat, dev link was mentioned. Um, if you are familiar with React, like I really think that this is like a new horizon of just Webflow being essentially like, I would put it as like a front end as a service, right? Where like, if Webflow can eventually be used as this tooling for just managing your front end UI on top of like, again, completely separate back end architecture through, you know, pulling in components using things like DevLink, like it's, we're just at the beginning. And my uh, just my personal observation, that is no like illusion to things that are coming or whatever. It's just like, yeah, stoked you're here. Uh, and thanks for, thanks for sharing. Yeah, it's like, I've been doing uh, custom code from last five years, and now yeah, I can relate. That's that's the thing how, how, why I love Webflow. I never, I have no other CMS experience apart from Webflow. So I tried uh, WordPress once, uh, not interested anymore. Uh, so now just I'm going with Webflow only. And uh, uh, there are other uh, like CMSs which are used for marketing, which my client as a, like uh, we were discussing about that, right? So my client is a marketer. He has a 10 to 15 years of experience. And I think uh, Ben, uh, the thing you mentioned about reading Google, Google Analytics and all, he is a guy. When I, whenever I say about that kind of thing, he says, no, man, I don't want any kind of links. Uh, any kind of this kind of things on the website, even though uh, there was a thing he wanted, like we have a very basic plan because uh, we don't ha have a very big website right now. So he wanted to connect a form with the HubSpot, right? Uh, if you go for that thing, we have to go for a bigger uh, plan. Then I just uh, did some search and I found out that there is a thing, uh, just add JavaScript in there, um, uh, which connects the form, uh, the Webflow form to the HubSpot. Uh, HubSpot. Like I've solved that problem very easily. So those kind of things, the custom embed code in the you know, web flow uh, on pages, on page wise or a website wise, like a lot of great features. I think uh, as, 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 as a, same as Ben, I'm also not a very fan of animations and little interactions. I'm happy with it, but big animations, I'm not into it. 
uh, like whenever I do the custom code, whenever someone say, I'd say, give it to some other developer, I'll, I'll build a clean website for you, then give it to some other to do animations. But when I came to the web flow, I think it makes animation really smooth or really easy to do as well. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm loving it, that's all. above that. Oh, can awesome. I say uh, uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate this group inviting me and allowing me to come hang out. Uh, Y'all have been a treat to, to talk with and, and learn from. I think the pleasure is the pleasure is ours. The pleasure. Sure. Yes. Thank Absolutely. you for, uh, Absolutely. for sharing. I think Corey dropping that whole mast thing has probably just volunteered himself to do a little demo at the next one for, uh, for yo, I'm, I'm super down again. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's, I'll be back. Yeah. Just to watch. <laughs> Good. I'm happy. I'm happy to do that for sure. That'd be awesome. We'd, and we'd love to hear all the goings on of the, uh, no code supply. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Did you see, so I, I signed up, I, I, uh, subscribed. Or there's you probably have so many subscribers you can't keep. <laughs> like I, I'll be honest, I, I I checked the subscriber list like maybe a few days after, and then I haven't looked at it since. <laughs> I yeah, you know. But thank you, thank you for doing that. Yeah, I'm ha I'm happy to show that setup if y'all are interested. Like cool. it's a big reason I'm an Airtable junkie on the side now, and I probably just need to have a no code intervention at some point. But it's fine. <laughs> I'm making the most of it. <laughs> Ben, uh, your present, your, your, your deck, your website. I mean, I hope you get some, uh, some more legs out of it than just, than just us. Hopefully it's something you can uh, work with your enterprise clients on, but that was, uh, that was super helpful as well. So thanks for putting that together. Link there in the chat, if anybody okay. wants to oh, review. Nice. Cool. Love it. I always, one of my favorite things is looking at my browser because I've got all these tabs after these, after these things <laughs> that I end up with like eight things. So, um, Arc, you need Arc as the browser that you're using. It's so wonderful if you haven't, if you haven't Arc? experienced it. Yeah. If you need an invite, yeah. Uncle Ben's got some invites. Like, just let me know. <laughs> oh, I, I have, yeah, I have it, but I haven't, uh, I haven't tested it out yet. I've had it for a month or two and I just, haven't taken the time. So. Well, Penny the was like ages ago. <laughs> it's um, it lets you like you can take that group of tabs you have open and immediately make a group out of them. It puts them in a folder and you can save them. And so you can say like these I'm saving. Just so you can shift select, multi select, like save these, put them up there. But then they have like a today section. So all of the tabs that you have open, like after 24 hours, they just disappear. Like if you're not going to save them, they're just gone. You don't have to worry about clearing them. You like. I leave work for the day. I come back the next morning, like clean slate. Uh, mm. It is, it is wonderful. And then they have these as like a fun switcher. So like you command T and it brings up what looks like a Slack switcher or spotlight or Alfred where you can just like switch to things. It's, uh, it's pretty wonderful. Hmm. I sent my wife a text. I was with her. I sent her a text. I was like, yeah, just open this up. I can't even remember what it was, but she was like, when I clicked the tab, there was another link I wanted to look. I was because I think we were looking at cars. And so I opened the one tab that was like a car review. And she's like, you have to close that tab and then open the new one. And I was like, why? And then I looked and she has literally hit her limit on how many tabs you can have open in so far. She has 500 tabs. I was, I was like, how can you do this? Yeah, that's her. She's got 500 Safari tabs open on her iPhone. I don't, I don't even want to ask what her email inbox looks like. <laughs> she, she needs like a belt. Like you need to give her a championship belt for hitting the, know, like, like the, the red, limit. Like, the red <laughs> alert bubble just has to say like dot, dot, dot. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not even a number anymore. Right? Like, oh, that Sad face emoji. <laughs> I think she's actually good on emails. She, she keeps her, her emails are good. It's for some reason, browser tab. You, when I open up her, she's got a, you know, like a, she has one of those like 11 inch MacBooks from like the MacBook, like it's not an air, but it was like, I think they just call it MacBook, but it was like the little, mm -hmm. little one from like 2015 and you open it up. So it's a small screen. And then right at the top on her browser is just all, it's like the smallest, it's like three pixels. Right. And it's just like, again, it, she's oh. hit the browser, the browser limit. It's so if I were to be like, Hey, you should try this art thing. 
she would she'd go no she'd be like you're getting rid of all my tabs my husband automatically like you don't have to think about it I don't know. My husband's like that. They apparently have jokes about his tabs on on their Zoom chats at his office. It's, <laughs> it's like, what do you even? Yeah. Arc's different though, right? Isn't it like you can like it? You can still have the tabs. They're just like not in sight, right? You like search for them in a way or something. It's yeah, like, they're 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 out of sight, out of mind. It's kind of right. you have like a sidebar, and then they have like favorites you can tab at the top. It's wonderful. Um, it has really made me, and they have like note taking inside of it that you can write markup and you can is capture it, parts of web pages and put it in those notes. Like it's wonderful. Really? What about is it your daily driver now, Ben? I use it. Uh, nobody from Upflow oh. is watching this. I use it every day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried for like half a day and I just have too many extensions that I use every day, like Chrome mm. extensions. They work. They work. They'll come across. And oh, now I they thought, actually I like- thought I- I saw something you had to like recreate them or something like that. No, they them. all come across now. They'll literally even import it from Chrome. I sort really? of had the same thing. It was oh, kind of like cool. when I bought, I bought a keyboard that like splits in two. And when I first started typing in it, like I was like, I, I, I will never be able to do this. Yeah. And like a half a day and I was like, maybe I should sell this to someone who will actually enjoy it. But like after a week, it was the same with the browser. Like after, after a few days, I was like, okay. I have this dialed in and what's really cool is they have it you know how like in chrome if you have profiles and you're like hey i'm gonna switch between my personal email and my work email you switch you'd have two different browsers so you flip between them in arc they create spaces in that sidebar so you just like control one control two control three it's the same window it just flips between your accounts so you can like personal work whatever uh, and flip between them, and it keeps everything separate. So that's that's equivalent to Chrome profiles. Then is yes, what you're yeah, really what, interesting. What a, one what window. About, what about what, system but, yeah. resources? I mean, the, is it good on system resources? Uh, it is. Chrome, it's terrible, Chromium. So. It's Chromium. <laughs> oh, so. okay. So so okay. Yeah. So it's about the same. It, it is a little lighter than the normal Chrome. I'll, I'll give them a little a little prop there but it's still it's still chromium mm -hmm. but right. the the key is you're going to have less windows open or tabs open yes because, much cleaner that's my problem when i'm researching something is i'll mm -hmm. have my quadzillion tabs on different you know subjects blah, 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 going and then you know i gotta bookmark them all yeah yes well and with this too because it has these things called easels you can capture part of the page and throw it in there. So it's like, instead of keeping the tab open, you're like, you researched it, you captured part of the page, you throw it in there with a link to it, and then you can close the tab. You don't need to keep it because you like have this like running, like sort of artboard where you, all of your content goes into. And like, you can have one page that kind of holds all that instead of having to save all the, the tabs. So it kind of frees you from that existence where you feel like you're tied to it like keeping right. these tabs open which is tough. This is right like because uh, you'll never find them again never <laughs> exactly never you're like i'm gonna add it to this bookmark folder and i promise i'll get back to it and you're like remember that one thing i said i was gonna get back what was it even called uh, or, or your think, system think. crashes and uh, or and you lose whatever you had I think you convinced me to try again, Ben, but mm -hmm. I just went to Arc site and then I was like, oh, try it yourself, which I should already have an account because like I said, I used it and it sent me to a type form. So how do oh. you feel about it now? <laughs> oh. <laughs> ben, ben is notoriously- Isn't it a browser? Wouldn't you, just, wouldn't you just open it up? Was it, or did you delete it from your machine? I, it was on an old machine. Yeah. I got a, I've got a different machine since then. And, and so I don't even, I, maybe I could find the email where it sent me the like download link. Cause it's still, Arc is still like, I guess, invite only or whatever. Right. Like you can't just go to their site and download it. Like you can Chrome or Firefox or whatever, but I know that I have access or I did. So I don't know. If someone here wants, doesn't have access and need an invite, I get like I five a week or something. Like, uh, oh, just let me know. I, yeah, 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 me. <laughs> uh, here, uh, here, I'm going to put my email in the chat here. Uh, just go ahead and, and email me and I'll hit you back with a link. So speaking I'm of things on it like blue bonnet. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of things where you're like, oh, maybe I'll try this and I just have to give it a shot. Like a browser is a big thing of like 
I feel like you got to really yeah. get a shot. Has anyone ever looked at the other keyboard layouts? Not QWERTY, but like yes. Dvorak. Dvorak. Yeah. Dvorak. I have. Have, have and, you done it? Like yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I actually worked at a place where like they like wanted everybody that could possibly. T- used Dvorak uh, to use it and uh, I got into it and then suddenly you know you leave that place and you get to the land of QWERTY again and you got to relearn QWERTY almost Uh, so I haven't gotten back into it then but it was really really good really Uh, I, I, I have been tempted to take it up at home again but the problem there is then you got to be quote unquote bilingual as it were mm-hmm. <laughs> and yes. yeah well, it, and my my hands I, i'm at the age right now where i'm i'm lucky i can keep one typing method in my head at a time <laughs> yeah i i'm always like intrigued uh of like oh yeah no this is actually a more efficient key layout you don't have to move your fingers as much this is science and i'm like oh that sounds cool and then i think through the process of actually doing it i'm like oh that would just be like so awful to learn. but it's i'm i'm impressed i'm like now more intrigued howard that you're saying no it was great it, it was, was an easy learn you know i took typing back in high school back back in the times when ibm selectric selectrics ruled the earth and uh um uh and that took me like a year to really get mastered and so forth and then uh i was working at a company called real networks if you remember them uh and uh and yeah they were I big do. On, yeah yeah real real player that was us so oh in, yeah. yeah 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 that was us back in this is this is back in the uh oh. Oh wow! Okay. Latish, uh, latish nineties, uh, and yeah, they wanted everyone on Dvorak, and if you did it, they they gave you all the training, and it was easier to learn than QWERTY was when I first learned it. So um, take that for what it's worth. Wow. Um, and then when I went back to QWERTY, uh, I I had to really shift my brain back into uh, that way of thinking, way of uh, working my fingers. Interesting. Penny, does that uh, does that keyboard of yours work? Does that that one you just showed? Does that work with Webflow? Uh, not it. The, the interface is a bit dusty. <laughs> 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 that poor old thing. That was my mother's uh, typewriter that she got in the late 1930s when she was in college. And my brother actually won uh, the Alberta provincial typing contest with it. And I typed on it. I I learned on it, but then I'm we were also learning on. I don't think there were electric computers at school. Actually, I'm even older than Howard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is that possible? I don't. It know. is. It oh. is. I I I I used select IBM Selectrics in my second job. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just old enough that you know I uh, I learned to program on a on a Trash eighty. Oh yeah, I did that too. Yeah. On a, a with a tape. Oh uh, yeah. Oh no. Well, no. I bought a. I, I thought I ruled the world because I bought a twenty megabyte hard drive, um, and I didn't think I'd ever fill that guy up. Never. Uh-huh. Ever. I know. I know. Yeah. I I bought a. I I got it on sale because it was obsolete by the time I bought it. My first computer was a. It was actually a luggable. It wasn't a portable. It was. It wasn't a laptop. One of the CPMs. But it, it was. It was a Zenith and it, oh, had a, yes. it was had a 10 meg hard drive. And the minute I bought it, the 20 meg came out. Yeah. Uh, Is this one of the ones that had the little like like three inch screen on it? No, it had actually a, a, a better screen than that. It was maybe six or seven inches, but it was blue. And this yeah. was pre pre Windows. Like this was years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And all of that stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're talking we're talking MS basic at best. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. base three plus and you put it in a, a I got a case 
and a printer and 20 pounds and I went all across the country with stupid oh my gosh yeah <laughs> no back horrible. then I was doing like z80 uh assembly programming oh yeah uh oh, wow. um god <laughs> I'm really feeling old right now <laughs> <laughs> that's okay you're not the only one uh, I just want to say anyway. that it's awesome at the same time though like i y'all are my heroes that you're you're still in it though like you're still like and and you have this perspective of where we've come from to where we are and that amount of change like hearing y'all talk about that is like so epic and inspiring out of like think about if we keep on this pace where are we gonna be mm -hmm. you're right, right? oh like, god oh, i know like i know in, in 20 years like it's it's incredible and what yeah. ben even said at the very beginning of all this is like it's just it's this is what keeps you coming back to the web and you know digital just changes so quick and it's like mm -hmm. that's what's entertaining about it. it's like it's not the same old ever and there's like this constant you know pace of learning that's almost required but like if you look at it almost as like a game in a way that like you just constantly want to keep leveling up your knowledge like that's that's super awesome and, and again it's just cool to see yeah y'all yeah. are still mm -hmm. i'm i'm I, freaking I, out because uh chat gpt codes better javascript than i do <laughs> with the right prompt with the with right, the right prompt. Prompt, still. <laughs> everybody tells me that every time i've asked chat gpt for code it's been wrong yeah, like yeah. it has not given me the right code yet oh really um, yeah i'm never asking it for like you know things that'll change the world i'm asking it hey do me this quick rollover for me i don't want to go into my <laughs> library <laughs> <laughs> i think i the the github copilot is for me been the one that's like yeah that ben and and many others have like turned me on to is is similar but it's like in vs code in like a coding environment and it's more of just like helping you along the way instead of here's an entire snippet or file uh it's so it's so cool and like yeah i don't know again even that is an example though howard is like what will this what will that look like now mm -hmm. 10 years even from now like if that mm -hmm. is just that is oh. just mainstay in every development tool that exists is ai right. in some way that also feels seamless too that it's not like intrusive or confusing or inaccurate mm -hmm. or you know yeah, you, you, yeah, you'd be, be... In 20 30 years back yeah. in the days when we were using css the dials right hey, i remember when i had to use these CSS yeah, is really, timeless. exactly i couldn't just think it <laughs> yeah right yeah and uh, and here i am i'm trying i'm going into mid journey and saying give, give me this user interface just to see what it's going to cough out and i'll, <laughs> I'll like re i'll uh recycle it a couple times just to see you know like get about a dozen different choices and like uh, one of them is going to be gold or a combination of a few of them is going to be gold. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, this, this old person has to go to bed now. So oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm East coast. Yeah. Yeah. This has been yeah. great. Thank so, you so much, everyone. It's been lovely. It's been so Thanks, good. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for having, having me. Thank time. you very Guys, much, Ben. Time. Thank you. Bye. 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 Twin yeah. cities forever. Bye. Yay.